Okay, so for this part of the lesson, we're going to be looking at igneous rocks. Um, first part of this is how rocks melt. And ultimately, we're going to be looking at the entire um, rock cycle itself and how rocks are recycled. But we're going to begin with um, the following slideshow about how it is that rocks melt, because this is the first component of the rock cycle. Let's also just go ahead of your um, couple other things we're looking at. So first thing I just like to point out is what you're looking at on this graph is a graph of temperature versus depth in the earth. That's your big red line. Then what you're looking at these little dotted lines are the boundary between when what is called the solidus. Oh, what is the solidus? This is the temperature at which a rock partially melts. Now, wait a minute. How do you have a partially melted rock? It's the same way you could have a smoothie or a Starbucks Frappuccino. Some of the ingredients have a higher melting point in the Frappuccino than do others. And so if you get that Frappuccino at just the right temperature, you have both little crystals of ice you're slurping up, and you have little bits of uh, liquid coffee and caramel and all the other goodness. And so, um, the solidus is the temperature at which a uh, substance goes from entirely solid to having some of its components start to melt. And so what you see is that generally if you go find an average spot in the Earth and dig down 100 uh, kilometers, you never actually will hit molten rock. Um, this is probably a good thing. Uh, and right at the uh, base of the lithosphere, however, you do see, you get close, maybe within about 50 degrees of the solidus of peridotite. So it's clear that it doesn't take that much extra heating to heat things up here. So maybe with just a little heat, maybe just making that melting point just a little bit lower, you might be able to uh, get somewhere. So again, looking at the Earth, we have our crust made of quartz, feldspar, hamphibol, and pyroxene. We have our olivine and pyroxene mantle, iron, nickel, and sulfur core. We have convection taking place at the mantle and outer core, and conduction taking place near the surface. So now we're going to... So how is it that we get melt in this process? Oh, so melt starts out with um, one of three processes. The first of these processes is decompression melting. Decompression is because the melting point changes with pressure and generally gets a little bit lower. So if you take some of that mantle rock, that olivine pyroxene that's in peridotite and bring it up and it's get it to where it's... If you move it upwards, you can get it to where it'll start to decompress. The other way is you can add heat. There are some places where there seems to be enhanced heat flow in the mantle that might allow some of that mantle peridotite to melt. Or third, you can add water. Water will lower the melting point of some minerals and you will get a melt even if the uh, rocks down deep are a little bit colder than they are in the average spot. So then once you melt rock, you then have to crystallize it. This is going to be the second step for making igneous rocks. And so in, we have here's a diagram of all the different places on Earth. Um, molten magma will solidify. It can solidify very deep. It can also solidify very close to the surface. And what you're seeing in this diagram is all these lines are kind of sort of proxies for crystal size. Because when a rock erupts near the surface, it um, generally is going to solidify very fast because the surface is cold by the standards of a liquid hot magma. Whereas at depth, you have a lot more solid material acting as insulation. That's going to slow down your cooling rate and crystallization rate exponentially. And so we break up igneous rocks into two major textural classes. The first one is extrusive. These are fine-grained um, 
rocks that are found at the surface and intrusive rocks. These are coarser grained rocks that formed at depth and then made it up to the way up the surface at a later time. And so what's again making this happen is crystallization and liquid hot magma. So we're going to take a look at the uh, various components of lava to better understand how they're formed. So as we go deeper in the rock cycle, what you'll learn is that all most, but not all, rocks are made up of minerals. Um, igneous rocks, typically because they represent melting, are made up primarily of silicate minerals. So we're going to put here a chart, um, this little diagram, some of the most common silicate minerals that end up in igneous rocks. And you're going to see there's that, you're going to definitely want to copy this organization because this organization will also give you clues into which type of minerals you're going to find in which of the major igneous rocks. And what this thing, this chart we're looking at is called Bowen's Reaction Series. Series, and let's get it started. So um, to start Bowen's Reaction Series, um, generally a couple little trends you're going to see um, in this diagram at all places. Um, minerals that are found towards the top of this tend to be higher temperature, form at higher temperatures. Temperas rocks, minerals that form at the bottom tend to be lower temperature than crystal lower temperatures. Temps, um, rocks towards the, minerals towards the top of this tend to be, have more ion, more ions in general and tend to be richer in things like calcium, magnesium, iron. Whereas minerals towards the bottom tend to be more covalent. Whereas, and the ions you do see are gonna be more like aluminum, sodium, and potassium going to be the most common ions in these. And as we'll see, these are also going to be generally let's change that fewer ions. There we go. Well, so this will also help you understand what happens to these once they start encountering rain. So the two minerals at the top of this chart are olivine and pyroxene. Incidentally, these are also the minerals that are make up the primary part of the mantle. We're going to call these the ultra mafic minerals, and we're going to use a green line to delegate them because they, they represent the hottest temperature crystallizing group of rocks. We call them the ultra mafic. So these two minerals combine to make um, the rock that's common to most of the mantle, peridotite. Now peridotite, you'll notice in this image, does look a little bit like it's made both both of these. And one of the things you're going to want to be doing if you're out in the field is being able to recognize the silicate minerals from Bowen's reaction series in the rocks you are looking at. And that's going to be your ultimate challenge. Now we're going to classify these rocks here into two major categories. We have our intrusive rocks, rocks which are going to have a phaneritic texture, texture, and we're going to be also looking at extrusive rocks, which have a uh, have a aphanitic or can't see crystals. Now there's other textures as well, but for understanding the primary igneous rocks, this is going to be the big one. Now, I might notice we don't have, I've not yet put an extrusive ultramafic rock out there. While there are a couple out there, there's something called cabodiite, there's kimberlites as well. These are generally very rare um, on Earth's surface because Ultramafic rocks, one, require a lot of heat. Two, um, they tend to be 
denser, so it's very tricky to get ultramafic rocks up to the surface in liquid, even in liquid form. And it is the partial melting of peridotite that forms the basis for all the other igneous rocks you're going to look at, and it's also the process by which all the other minerals in this Bowen's reaction series form. So now we're going to jump back to the PowerPoint and uh, look at a little bit more of how this partial melting process goes down. Uh, you got a couple versions on your PowerPoint as well. So, um, so when you lower the pressure, what essentially you're doing is taking this geotherm and moving it upwards a little bit until you get a little bit, because it turns out not olivine and not all pyroxene is the same. Some versions of it have some of those crystals, depending on their iron and magnesium content, will have a lower melting point than will others. And this is one of those things we don't really touch upon much in this class, but it's definitely there. So again, here's some more pictures of all of peridotite, and here's kimberlite, which is perhaps the most uh, exciting ultramafic rock. Then we start um, partially melting it, you're going to get a couple of new minerals. One of the things that's going to crystallize out of this partial melt is a uh, mineral known as plagioclase. Plagioclase, noted for its striations. Striations. And you're also going to get You're also going to start to see a little bit of horn blend as well. Let's see if we can get this buggered actually. Okay. You can get this thing to actually move. Yep. And then you're also going to start to see horn blend slash ampable. Laughable. And so these minerals are forming the basis. You're still evolving, but now you're getting plagioclase and pyroxene. And this is going to form the basis for your um, mafic igneous rocks. Mafic rocks include, um, of course, gabbro, which is um, a coarse grain. Yeah, bro. So, pictured here forming part of this tabletop. But mafic magmas, unlike ultramafic magmas, do make their way to the surface on a regular basis, and especially when they're hot, are generally light enough to make it to the surface. When they make it to the surface, they become extrusive, and they get a rock called basalt. Um, Pictured right here on the uh, right. Well, let's get a better picture of both these because um, not because this decompression melting is fairly common in Earth's uh, solar system. But not only does this happen, so we definitely on Earth um, decompression melting will give us exciting rocks like uh, gabbro and basalt. By the way, if you notice this iridescence, that's real. That um, iridescence is. Uh, some of the felspars looking a little bit more sort of iridescent, uh, which some of the plagioclases places will do. But um, not only does this process happen on Earth through seeing beautiful samples of basalt and, uh, and at the surface and gamma depth, but you also see this happen on other planets. Decompression melting happens on Venus, which is partially why the entire surface of Venus is covered in basalt. You also see basalt all over the surface of Mars. Now, to get any of the other types of igneous rocks, you're going to need to do something a little more intense. That'll happen in the next section.